I'm very happy to be here with my good, good, good friend, Larry Brilliant, who uh, you probably, if you are an SNS member, you already know who Larry is, and you, if, or if you watch CNN, or if you have COVID. And, oh. Oh, no, no. <laughs> and, and Larry is uh, not the last one. Yeah, yeah, well, not the last one. Um, if you didn't know, uh, he is the founding CEO of Pan Defense Advisors, and he is a medical analyst for CNN. And he is the uh, I love this title. Uh, my favorite title of a book, I think, uh, given his name, uh, Sometimes Brilliant. And then uh, the, the founder of Siva Foundation or Seva Foundation. Busy guy. And um, uh, let's see, Sally, I think you should probably de uh, camera eyes. I'm seeing Hi, Sally. Sally. <laughs> Larry and Sally are friends from long ago, long time. So, Larry, I'd love to have you here. Glad we're here. And we have a lot to talk about. We have time to do it. I'll mention to the people who are with us right now at the end of this conversation, we're going to have 10 minutes for audience QA. And so those of you who have questions for speakers during this conversation, please drop them into the chat and we will call on you directly. So uh, Larry and I had, I think we've had two conversations now, pre-conversations to this one. Uh, for me, that's always as much fun or more fun than the, when you finally get to the, the finish line. Uh, but one of the things we talked about, which I thought was pretty interesting and it's a good foundation for us. Uh, Larry, you were talking about uh, just the on, the on march of civilization and the inevitability of an increasing number of pandemics. Um, and I'll frame that by saying, um, I this morning we we're talking, you, I don't think you're on yet, Larry, I don't know, we we're talking about you. And um, Barrett and I are doing the survey of all the things in the world coming up. And she said, well, no one saw this coming. I said, well, actually one guy, Larry Brilliant saw the COVID, well, saw the pandemic coming. And uh, I remember going to your Pan, Pan Defense 2, I think it was, one. one down in the valley, where for two days we uh, heard, met, saw, and talked with um, many people about the inevitable pandemic coming and what would it be like and how, what kind of response to have. So obviously you've seen this problem both from the perspective of smallpox and ending that problem uh, and looking forward and seeing the inevitability of this happening again. So when you look at, around the world at the changes that civilization brings in our connection with and relation to nature, uh, why is it, if it is inevitable, why is it inevitable that we're having an increased risk of pandemics as we go? Uh, well, first of all, it's wonderful to be with you and your family and with SNS, my, my family, I think of it as my family too. Yeah, your tribe. Um, and I want to uh, put an asterisk at the very beginning because the title of my book is sometimes brilliant, but if you open it up, it also say other times not so. <laughs> really important. Good title. Um, so uh, when you came in 2005 uh, to that meeting, we were worried about H5N1, mm -hmm. which is a highly pathogenic bird flu. And it had jumped species from birds to humans, and it was killing 60% of the humans that it infected. But it hadn't yet become fit for humans. It didn't learn how to be transmissible, as we've seen from Omicron. Um, so that was one where we worried, we prepared, it didn't happen because it was lethal, but not transmissible. Fast forward to 2008, 2009, we had another pandemic, swine flu, H1N1, and all flus are really bird flus, they're really duck flus. <clears throat> um, but in the case of this pandemic, it became a real pandemic. It probably infected 2 billion people. But the reason it didn't rise to this level of concern as COVID has done, is that it wasn't uh, lethal at a very low case fatality rate, almost lower than ordinary seasonal flu. So if you keep those two things in mind, a, a, a virus which is highly lethal, but not transmissible, not very much tr transmissible. On the other hand, a vir virus which is highly transmissible, but not so lethal. Now fast forward to um, SARS-CoV-2 and the coronavirus family. And, and they're tremendously lethal, 
and they're tremendously transmissible. Now, when I say tremendously lethal, I speak as a public health person. I'm not speaking as a clinician. If you get the disease, your risk of dying from it is quite low. But if you have 7 billion people who contract it, which is certainly what's going to happen before we're over with this pandemic, maybe it will happen with Omicron Prime alone, uh, if it really only kills one out of a thousand, you're really up there in the huge numbers. And, and right now, the scorecard is 10 million worldwide who died from this disease. Probably if you added all the ones that were undercounted, it's an order of magnitude more. It's certainly a pandemic. Um, so what, what causes these viruses to leap from animals to humans? Well, number one, humans moving into animal territory, clear cutting the, the Amazon in order to have a, a so, soy uh, factory, <clears throat> or moving in, uh, as we've seen very often in Southeast Asia, uh, to have suburbs in what was jungle a few minutes ago. The diet that we have, um, if you uh, eat uh, animals, particularly wild animals, uh, you'll be in a very intimate relationship. Forget about sex. There's nothing more intimate as a relationship than eating another animal. And last year in Africa alone, over 2 billion kilograms of bush meat was mm -hmm. consumed by human beings. Some of it was packaged. Uh, these wet markets uh, that we're, uh, we're seeing was certainly complicitous, if not was dispositive in the origin story of, of COVID. They're, uh, they're virus um, accelerators. You couldn't accelerate a virus better than getting it into a wet market. Um, so eating it ex exotic animals. And I can go on and on and on. The more you cement over, asphalt over, natural hep territory. Uh, if you saw the movie Contagion that I was an advisor on, the final scene that Steven Soderbergh put in that, um, which was a bat being pushed out of its habitat by clear cutting, uh, and then a bat eating an apple, dropping the apple, the pig picking it up, pig catching the disease, and then the pig becoming supper for Gwyneth Paltrow. And that began that make-believe pandemic, but it was all too prescient and too real. Um, and there's probably a list of about 15 or 20 things that civilization is doing. Uh, we, we shouldn't forget just how many there are of us. Um, uh, COVID will be the disease which infects more people in a short period of time than any other disease in history, if for no other reason than we've never had seven and a half billion people before in history. Uh, those are the kinds of things uh, we can go on and on from the leather that you wear if you wear mink, uh, and mink are, you know, as we now know, able to transmit the virus back to humans. Uh, uh, a lot of things that we do as human beings that make it more likely. And I, I sent you earlier uh, an article I wrote in 2008 uh, for the Wall Street Journal, which was called The Age of Pandemics. I'm not particularly happy about that one or the one I did in Foreign Affairs that I say called the forever virus. I don't like those titles, but they are both things for us to think about. Mm -hmm. So I want to come back in just a few minutes, two minutes to COVID, but I, you said something just now that caught my ear. Should we have any concern about what I think looks like a reawakening of bird flu on the east coast of America? Well, not yet. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't get worried about it yet. It doesn't show that it's fit for humans yet. Mm -hmm. um, and the genome doesn't particularly you know, reach out and yell, I'm, I'm a big danger yet. Sure. But yes, we should be concerned about bird flu. Um, it is the the prime way in which the, the virus begins its life, um, either as chicken or poultry or wild ducks. Um, and so we should always be concerned about it. Uh, it is a, it, there's a lot of people watching all the bird flu in the world. So, yeah. Okay. So coming back to Kobe for a minute uh, or more, more than a minute, uh, we talked uh, recently about this issue of what you called, I think, big variants. Um, I was asking you about, and I, you know, from my perspective, which is kind of Stanford biochemistry, not virology, but um, seeing uh, a large number of mutations, seeing 39 mutations in a spike area alone and 50, muta 50 odd mutations in the, in one go, in one jump, at least from our perspective, from medical perspective. Um, when you're used to seeing one or two or three, 
Um, there's a lot more to the story, as you and I both know, about were these man-made or were they not, or are they a combination of things? And um, uh, we talked about briefly about um, Ralph Barrick and, and his work on gain of function, which he published openly. Uh, he expressed his fears of the future of that pathogen openly. I think that the U.S. government took it to heart and stopped doing that research in North Carolina. Um, I think we, we both agreed it got moved over to Wuhan Virology Lab. Uh, we know that a lot of money was sent over there to help those guys do that work. And um, uh, so I, there are two parts. There, there's a fourth coming up in this conversation. But the first part is big variants. You know, we go along and we see one, two, one, two, two, one, one, two, and then there's 50. And um, you had laid out many of what I would call the classical reasons why you would see that. Would you go through those? I think there's three big big ones, or maybe a fourth. The fourth being we've missed some large chain of transmission in an uh, island that uh, it doesn't get visited by viral sequencing very much. That That's a possibility that there's been uh, a, a viral chain of transmission going on and hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of uh, people have gotten the disease. Um, and so this was a natural occurrence. It could also be tens of thousands or tens of millions of animals. So mm -hmm. if you take hamsters or mink or white-tailed deer uh, or any of the other dozen or two dozen species that now have SARS-CoV-2, right. you wouldn't necessarily see those mutations taking place. And then they aggregate all of a sudden and one uh, now, now a variant, one virus that's got all those mutations goes to a human and it, it arrives and we, we don't see that delta, we don't see that jump. Right. Um, I, I think that it's without a question that um, individual human beings who are immunocompromised, HIV AIDS, chemotherapy, other forms of immunocompromised disease, who also get COVID, they're going to be struggling uh, to ward off COVID whether they've been vaccinated or not. And so it could be that COVID lasts for months in an individual. Mm -hmm. And every time, if you, if you think about a disease that infects you with a virus, it's not really just one virus. You get a viral swarm. At any given moment, all those viruses are mutating and there's hundreds of mutations back and forth. And then one of them is the strongest because it can elude your immune system. And then that one is the one that gets passed on to the next person. But if that all happens in one individual and they're immunocompromised, it may be that only when that virus reaches escape velocity mm. and leaves that immunocompromised person, it could have 60 new mutations. Right. I'm, Omicron is a particularly suspect one because it contains in the genome a segment of what looks to be a human cold virus, 229E. Very interesting. So how could it have gotten in there unless it was kind of cooking, simmering in somebody who was immunocompromised who got SARS-CoV-2 and got a cold? Well, one, one obvious answer, Larry, would be it was put there. Well, you wouldn't put it in there because it is a, a attenuating uh, string of proteins. Answer. Not an exacerbate. Not, it, it, it doesn't increase lethality or, or danger. It decreases it. So let's, let's, right. So let's go backwards a little bit. Um, I, everything that you're describing, I would call a natural event. And um, uh, they all, all these things that you're describing, I would call reservoirs in one way or another, where they're pools of protection until release. So they happen somewhere else, you know, whatever, however you want to say that. And then, yeah, off, yeah, yeah. Now I'm um, going back to Ralph Barrick. So we know that people did gain a function work. We don't know if it's the same exact bug, as far as I can tell. Um, we know there is a German scientist who looked at COVID-19 when it came out very early and said that the, the fissure is, is not natural, would never have happened. Almost almost purely, um, what do they call it? A, um, uh, when you have two different animals. Um, chimera. Chimera. Almost certainly chimera of some kind. So anyway, I don't, you know, everyone has their own religion on this, but I think if I understood you from the last time we talked, when we talked about where did this um, COVID-19 originate, and I have, I have two reasons, not just one this time to ask you this. There's some more propaganda that just came out yesterday. Um, You're talking about the two articles that appeared over the weekend? 
Yes. Yeah, I, I don't think. Wait, wait, wait! Don't go there yet. Don't go there. Yet. <laughs> so, um, so I, I think that you and I both agree that that the likelihood is, best way to put it, it did in fact come out of the Wuhan Virology Laboratory without making any statements about who, what, where, when, or how. But um, uh, at the very most benign, someone got sick inside the laboratory. And then, as you put, put it, his wife went to uh, the wet lab before anybody was contagious or, or symptomatic yet. And it was at, at that at, at the, wet, the wet market. And then that was where other contagion occurred. So are you, is that a safe description? Um, so first of all, there, there, there's not one laboratory. There's two. There's the Institute of yes, CDC and the CDC. They're both in the one. Um, and, um, you know, I would say that if they were not doing studies on uh, SARS, SARS-1, if they were not doing studies on bats, if they were not trying to understand what dynamic would make them more dangerous or less dangerous, they would be guilty of medical malpractice. I've heard that, but I think it's also true that they were doing that. Yeah, well, I, I do think they were doing that, but I think you have to do that if you're the only country in the world that gave birth to SARS in the first place okay. for six months. But my question, Larry, is simple. I think it's your point of view, and I, I know it's mine, that the likelihood is high that, in fact, the escape happened through the laboratory. But, but that's very different than human engineered. So the evidence that you put forth right. about the fur and cleavage is that's weird. That shouldn't have been there. It didn't happen naturally. Of course, now we're seeing it occur naturally in many of the new variants. So I don't think that that would hold the same amount of um, persuasive power as it did before. Okay. Look, look I, I spent a good part of my life uh, trying to eradicate smallpox. And then after we had eradicated it, and it didn't exist in the world. While we were pursuing the obligatory two-year period of not being able to find it, we prepared a great big party, and we had all the nations of the world ready to sign on a um, declaration that smallpox had been eradicated. In that period of time, there was another uh, case of smallpox, but it wasn't in Bangladesh, and it wasn't in Somalia. It was in England, and it was in Birmingham. Lab release. And it had escaped from a lab of somebody who was working above the lab, a photographer, and Janet Parker is her name, and she died because she got smallpox from that lab. I think a bigger thing to worry about is that the, some of these studies that the Chinese were doing in Wuhan were not being done in a BSL-4 lab. There you go. BSL-3 lab, but they were being done in a BSL-2 lab. That's the thing that should be universally condemned for anybody who's doing that. But it is a sin of omission rather than a, or what is it? A, it's, a more, it's a venal sin, not a more, mortal sin. Yeah. That's yeah, Catholic here. <laughs> but, but in terms of, of, behave, of what, what behavior, of proper care and practice in virology, I know the French were trying to help the Chinese uh, at that time or just before then to create four, BSL-4. But um, if you don't have it, the idea that you would put these experiments into a laboratory anyway. Yeah, I mean, they had BSL-3, and it should have been in a BSL-3 at the very least. Um, look, the, the two articles that appeared this weekend were done by competent people, and they uh, add evidence on the ledger of the explosive start of the outbreak, which looks more like a point source outbreak rather than person to person because of the way it just exploded that that was exacerbated by or contributed to by the, the fish market, one of the wet markets that China still has. Um, and, I, you know, there's some persuasive arguments in that. However, there's nothing in that argument that goes back to what was the index case? What was the first case? There's no evidence, genetic evidence at all in that paper that any of the animals in that market had that disease. Oh, no, there's a lot of evidence that it was in the animals. Uh, that Later. But what there's not is that it was the first. Thank you. We don't know that it was the first. We don't know that it went from a bat to a pangolin. In, in the article, there's no evidence. No, that's right. Thank so you. to me, the, the uh, you know, and again, I have friends who I trust and I respect and I love, and they're, they're saying that they're, you know, 60, 40 or 80, 20, that it was natural. Or, and I'm probably 40, 60 that it was somebody who got sick, got infected by one of these 
um, bats that was carelessly handled, went home, asymptomatic as much of COVID cases are, went home and then their family asymptomatic went to the, you know, the fish market or exactly. there it went. Um, the bigger sin for me though, that we're, I don't want to gloss over because I think all of that can be excused by, you know, or irresponsibility. The biggest sin for me was the idea that once there was an outbreak and we had a hundred cases of an, a, a brand new kind of pneumonia, we knew we had an epidemic, if not a pandemic, that it was Chinese New Year and the Chinese government permitted anyone going through Wuhan to go to any foreign country, 5 million people as reported, um, but they weren't allowed to go anywhere else in China. And that's, I'd like to see more written about that because that's an act that uh, is more than just a handful of people or one person being careless. That's a state act. Um, yes. If true, uh, and uh, it's it's a bigger that's a bigger sin than all the things we're talking about. Yes, and and you've said it more clearly than I've heard it before, so I appreciate you're doing that, and maybe by us doing it together, you know, the word will get out a little more. Um, one one thing we have said uh, consistently is, regardless of how the escape happened from that laboratory, kind of figure that happened, um, the subsequent handling of the problem and of the data and or lack of data of lack of transparency was its own bad acting, aggressive acting. Yeah, yeah, but, but even worse was letting people go who might be infected with the disease. No way. Quarantine, it, you know, an epidemiologist coming to the scene, 100 cases, highly transmissible, high degree of lethality would have quarantined the entire city. Yes, yeah. And what they did was they did this half quarantine, but it, yeah. So I, I agree with you. I think that what you call the, the greater sin was was to let five million people go around the world when they weren't letting a thousand go around China. And that's why you you know you saw that huge, very poignant outbreak in in Italy, northern Italy, uh, where the doctors were getting sick and so many Italian doctors died. Right. Yeah. From it. At the same time, we had all the problem with the cruise ships on the West Coast and then the big outbreak in New York. Those things represented seeding of a highly transmissible disease carried by a lot of people who were not quarantined. Right. Well, we'll let somebody else smarter than you and I figure out why the Chinese continue to be unreliable partners in releasing information right to this day. It's, it's, it's a strange situation. And I want to I want to move. <laughs> now that we've gone dark, on, here's another question for you. And then we have to come back to our title, which is, you know, how to prevent or stop this ep epidemic. So this pandemic. So um, when we look around the world, and we talked about this last week, we look around the world and we see all the countries like New Zealand and Australia and others who have tried the zero COVID approach and inevitably failed. And so um, in, in, in the cases I'm mentioning, they, you know, they, you just can't keep the genie in the bottle forever. And then suddenly you've just got to vaccinate everybody because that's the only way out of the hole. Um, China, however, doesn't see it that way. And this is going to lead us into our long COVID conversation. So um, do you think, what is your personal opinion about why China, with 1.4 billion people now, is still following a zero COVID practice? Well, I, I think a zero disease practice is a good practice when you don't know what the disease that you have is going to do and you don't have a vaccine. So, for example, I think Vietnam, which went 100 days without a single case, yeah. South Korea, which was able to maintain zero COVID almost until Omicron, until a more transmissible variant showed up. Uh, New Zealand, the same thing, parts of Australia or Australia off and on. Uh, those really are the heroes, the winners of stage one of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Once you got a vaccine, it's a different game. And once you have more transmissible variants, and I, I wanna clarify one thing for everyone, uh, every successive variant will be more transmissible than its antecedent. That's the Good nature. Point. Yeah, right. But it is not true that it will simultaneously become more mild. That's an urban myth. Mm -hmm. uh, those are two uh, independent variables. And it depends a lot on the incubation period. If, if the virus is going to be transmitted before it kills you off, it's indifferent to what well, it we can anthropomorphize. 
Um, so I, I think that China's early uh, errors, I would say, in the handling of the outbreak uh, led to a kind of overreaction going forward. And they, they had a success uh, in Wuhan when they did this uh, hyper-vigilant uh, lockdown. And so they replicated it and that, they just became, that became the practice. Now, from a Chinese perspective, when everyone got vaccines, they refused to import mRNA vaccines. Um, they didn't import the AstraZeneca. By the way, they have uh, Pfizer mRNA vaccines in China right now. They have a license to use it and they're not using it. So the vaccines that they made, Sinopharm and Sinovac, are just not that good. Right. So that if you know that the vaccine that you have is 40% effective right. instead of 90% effective, what are your choices? So are you saying that politically it's un, it's unpalatable to them to use the good stuff? I, I don't know. I can't speak to volition or intentionality. I can only say um, they should be using the best vaccine regardless of where it's made. The United States history is not that we always use the best vaccine regardless of where it's made either. So um, they're not. And so they chose this zero COVID. They chose lockdown. Uh, now let's look at some numbers because I think where you want to go to and where I want to go to too is that right now the the major problem with the people who are thinking well it's all over the pandemic is over uh, they're forgetting about the animals that still have uh, COVID and are continuing to spin off new variants they're forgetting the immunocompromised people they're forgetting the fact that all vaccines wane so does the immunity you get from having Omicron mm -hmm. so eight months from now, 10 months from now, if you don't get another uh, bout of COVID or you don't get vaccinated, immunity will have waned. So there's a, but there's an even worse potential reservoir and that's China. Because if it's got 1.3 or 1.4 million population, really? and if their zero, zero COVID policy has restricted the number of people who actually got the disease to let's say 100 million people, 200 million people, that still leaves 1.1 or 1.2 billion people who haven't gotten it. And all of them have probably been vaccinated with a vaccine that's got a 20, 30, 40% efficacy. That leaves at least half a billion people who have almost no immune. We call them immunologically naive. If a new variant or an old variant, if alpha, beta, gamma, yeah. Yeah. it's into China and it will, what are those people going to do? They're going to get the disease and if you have something that's as transmissible as BA2, yep. self Omicron, then the risk that China explodes again with another epidemic and that it gets exported is really high. Um, you can just see how hard it was for them to struggle at the Olympics. And still there were hundreds of people who contracted Omicron and a lot of them who went there. Everything you're saying, Larry, is exactly why I'm asking you this question of why would, I think the Chinese are smart. They may be too proud for their own good, but they're smart. And so it, if you know everything you just said to me, and I assume they do know all this or more, let me let me frame it this way, which I did with you the other day. If we're correct that the bug, that this version of the bug came out of the Wuhan Virology Laboratory, they know better than anybody what it is and what it can do. That may not be a lot, but, but they're the experts. So... My concern I'm is... Sure, I'm not so sure that I, I agree with that. I mean, I once, once it's out and Would the you? whole scientific community worldwide has it, I doubt that there's that much of a competitive advantage to having been there at its birth. What we don't know is what testing they did. That's what I'm trying to say. So... Um, I think I think the answer is that they've they've kept the zero COVID policy because they're working on two mRNA vaccines right now because they've gotten the technology um, and through a technology transfer agreement that may have been generously interpreted. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna have an mRNA vaccine and they think that, that they'll be able to manufacture that vaccine uh, in quantities large enough and quickly enough that it could head off this explosion. I think they're playing with fire. Well, that's you're a wonderful man and that's why I love you so much, Larry. And I appreciate you have a big heart too. Meanwhile, let's let's use this pathway into the next question, which is long COVID. And um, please correct anything I say that you don't agree with. But 
it, it appears to be uh, that this disease can affect many different parts of the body. Uh, it can show up after months of appearing to be gone. Uh, it can affect your brain. It can affect al almost all of your organs, not just your lungs. It was originally called a kidney disease when in New York when it first came out. Um, so a lot of ways you can you can be affected over as long COVID, over time. And um, not a lot of understanding, because as you've pointed out to me recently, not a lot of time to get that understanding yet of what does that all mean? So talk about long COVID and and I, I, I'm going to just keep reframing this. If the Chinese knew, if they were more afraid of long COVID than we were, they would do what they did. I'm not saying that's why they did it. I mean, to your point, though, if, if, you're, if you're present at the birth of the virus and somebody walks out with the illness, you, you don't know anything about long COVID. Yeah, but if you had it for two long. years and you, and you actually had studied it, that would be different. I don't think anybody's had this for two years and studied it. Right. I think that they certainly had bat coronavirus. They've had bat SARS. So have we. It's, you know, labs all over the, the world have. But, but I think that, um, I think long COVID is a very serious problem and I think we're underestimating it. Um, if for no other reason, uh, if we look at the United States where Medicare is the final pay or of all chronic diseases in the end, um, we're going to wind up with a, a distorted healthcare system over the next few years. And let's just say the first case of was identified in the United States December 5th. This is a puppy. It's less than three months old. So of course we can't know anything about what's going to happen three months hence. In fact, we know very, very little of what happened six weeks hence. So we don't know about Omicron. We've got a little bit more experience with Alpha, Beta, Delta, Gamma. Um, and we can see that as many as one out of, as many as between one out of 10 and three out of 10 people who've had those previous variants wind up with long COVID defined as still having symptoms after six months. Big number. That's scary because we don't know. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of friends with long COVID. It's a devastating disease as I've seen it. I'm sure there's long COVID that's mild. Mm -hmm. Long COVID that's real, I've seen people with heart attacks, with strokes, with cardiovascular my myocarditis, um, people who could never walk again, who are not the same person anymore because of the multiple small petechiae, small strokes in their brain. Um, so I'm very worried about it. We've underplayed it. We haven't talked about it enough. Uh, there's a lot of ageism in that and a lot of classism in that, that we haven't really spent enough time thinking about it, talking about it. But I'm afraid that it will come back to really haunt us. And right now, when you just think that COVID as a pandemic has sucked all the oxygen out of the healthcare community, out of our hospitals, and out of our research, we want to get done with it. But it's not done with us. Right. And so one of the ways it's not done with us is that as we begin to see mysterious diseases, strokes that shouldn't have happened, um, and we're going to track it back down to COVID, um, I think we've got a big problem on our hands. I, I can't. I can't use that as an explanation for why China does a lock, lockdown. That they knew that in advance. Um, but I can use it as a, a, as a question: Why the hell are we so slow in recognizing what a big effect it has? Why are the economists not raising it as an issue because of health economics? Yeah, you're reading my mind. You, you just walked right into the next thing I was going to ask you because. I was going to flip it and say, let's say you're king of, of America, or whatever they call it now, uh, and you have all these executive powers. We came close, but it didn't happen. Not quite yet. Yeah, right. Okay. One can only hope if you're Mr. Trump. So um, uh, let's say you're president, and you now know what we now know two years later, uh, maybe not enough, but something more uh, for sure about long COVID. If you know now what you, we know, and you had the power to go back, would you have had a zero COVID policy instead of what we had did so that you wouldn't have that burden of all those three out of 10 people, maybe? Who are... I don't know that, that a one, I don't know that a zero COVID policy works against Omicron. However, I do know that the Swedish model, which is to let the virus ram, ram free and everybody gets it because we'll get immune that way. That's idiotic. Uh, and with Scott Atlas, or any of the people who have hope. No, no, I, I don't, I'm not suggesting the Swedish model. I'm suggesting zero COVID. Well, but there's a, there, these are antipodes. Um, 
We should be taking the disease more seriously even now. Uh, this week, uh, New York has announced that they're uh, ending their mask mandates for indoor activities. California's primed to do that in this week. I do spend a lot of time with the wonderful folks in California, and I think Mark Galley and Gavin are trying to do their very best. But the pressure of getting over it and getting back to real life and the real harm that it does to keep people apart, to, you know, the, the economic harm and the, the psychological harm um, has really pushed people to say, okay, well, it's mild. Don't worry about it. The fact is, just because it's mild, we have not proven that it has a lower case uh, infection to long COVID rate. Uh -huh. So it could be creating a lot more long COVID. And we certainly haven't uh, realized that letting it go means there'll be more people who will get the disease. Therefore, there'll be more people who are immunocompromised, who will cook it. Therefore, we're creating the circumstances that can create more variants. It, it's, it's, it's not good policy. Yeah, it, it's, I, I think you've framed it beautifully. It's just something which, and I think most people haven't quite gotten their arms around. Certainly what you're saying is true about the media. I mean, we don't hear a lot of concern about that part of the, of the pandemic. Um, you, you know, uh, Mark, uh, early on, uh, something like 85% of all the deaths in Pennsylvania were in people over 80. And so it seemed to be a disease that only killed the elderly. Remember all the nursing homes? Oh yeah. I mean, it was part of being congregate living as well as being elderly, as well as being discarded by their communities. Um, I think part of it was that. Now, now we're seeing young people who do get COVID, even though they may not have a lot of symptoms, can get long COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now let's jump back. This is the, the sin of omission of your moderator. The, the, the theme of our time together today is, you know, how do you end a pandemic? So having done one, what do we do? Well, we, we, we can't do what we did in smallpox and, um, and polio. We can't eradicate it. Um, we, we can't even control it and we can't get to herd immunity. As long as you've got uh, animals that are able to perpetuate the disease and you, it, it's not even a candidate for herd immunity. It's a wrong concept to have. Um, uh, we could get lucky and the aggregate combination of uh, people who've gotten uh, COVID as a disease, who've had four doses of vaccine. I know people who had COVID plus four doses of the vaccine and still got Omicron, uh, but it was very mild. Um, it, it may be that it becomes so mild for those people that for them, the pandemic is ending. Mm -hmm. It's not ending for people in China. I mean, as we speak right now, 84% of uh, people in Africa have not had dose one. Of right, that. right. I mean, they're not going to get herd immunity by just getting Omicron. It just, it's not an immunogenic virus, by the way. If you've got uh, Omicron, you can be reinfected with BA2. If you've got BA2, you can be re reinfected with Omicron. It's not, doesn't give you a lot of confidence that just getting that one disease is going to uh, make you immune. I do think if you've been vaccinated that many times and you've had it, you're pretty safe. But uh, how can we afford that for the whole world? How long will it take? Moderna, by the way, is not cooperating. They're not keeping their promises. They're not creating enough vaccine. Neither Pfizer nor Moderna have been really eager to have factories built so that the production of the vaccine is proximate to where the disease is. That's a very selfish and short-sighted thing. They thought they had to make their money, you know, while the disease was there. A lot of bad understanding of how diseases work, I'm afraid. Strange, I didn't know that. So, so um, from what you've learned and what you've told us today, when you look forward, um, make up any number you want to, three years from now, without, I'm gonna, I'll put a codicil in here, without another, major variant showing up in three weeks or what, over that period of time, just given what we've got in the in circulation so far, plus some variants that pop up here and there, what lifestyle are we living then? I mean, forget the political pressures and the anger and the internet and the Republican party going crazy and all that kind of stuff. Um, just from as a person, you know, as yourself, when you ask yourself, what am I gonna be doing and living in three years? Are you still wearing a mask uh, when you go indoors? 
So I'm very grateful to the pandemic for uh, teaching me an error that I've always made for, I always thought it was Dickinsonian, but it's Dickensian. It's a very Dickensian world that I look at three years from now. It'll be the best of worlds. It'll be the worst of worlds, best of times, the worst of times. Um, and it, it, it could very well be that uh, the virus has uh, not disappeared and has continued to ricochet back and forth between these quasi reservoirs in animals and in people immunocompromised and in China and in Africa. We have such a high percentage of people who are immunologically naive. It could be that it's disappeared and uh, has become quiescent, a better word than um, endemic. That's a terrible word. It doesn't fit any of the things we've talked about. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes quiescent and then only pops up every once in a while. And there's good evidence for that historically. Uh, you know, this is, we think of this as the third coronavirus, SARS, MERS, and uh, COVID, but it's actually the seventh. We have four other coronaviruses that look a lot like SARS-CoV-2, and they may have in prehistory created a pandemic. They may have uh, created a pandemic. It could have been the Athenian plague, the Justinian plague. They were wrongly categorized. And they circled the world and they've infected people for three or four years. And then they went to the retirement home for coronaviruses. They became colds. Mm -hmm. So we have four coronaviruses that look like COVID that are now colds. And what do we know about them? Well, we know you get one and you don't get it again for a year or two. That's the amount of immunity you get. And then another one that's a little bit different, a variant, can still infect you. So that every year you can get a cold, but the periodicity between getting the same one is one or two years. That may be what the future of this pandemic is. And the people who think it's going away, they do believe that. They think that that's the, that's the condition precedent uh, that this virus may um, go in. Um, of course, the opposite of that is that we will continue to get more variants. The people who are highly uh, vaccinated, have had the disease, will have a very mild case of it. And then we'll get that other Dickensian idea that the world is haves and have nots. And in this case, it will be the have nots who don't have the, the virus, don't have the vaccine and are susceptible. And the world gets ever more um, divisive. And I think if it's one thing we all agree on is that this pandemic, forget about the fur and cleavage and the genome, it has really shown the cleavage in, in our life and the dis disparate way that people are, are fortunate or unfortunate or the, um, the huge disparities between life expectancy, the quality of life expectancy that we have in the world. And this may yet become one more um, of the problems we have to face because of that. Right. I want to mention to our audience, uh, please post your questions for Larry in the chat and uh, we will get to them in just a minute or so. Um, I, I want to make one note here that um, what you're saying is obviously true worldwide, Larry. I, I continue to wonder whether the internet didn't help us be divided on so many issues, including deniers of vaccination here who had the money, had the chance, and just didn't want to do it. I'm so, uh, surprised. Uh, about five years ago, the Rockefeller Foundation um, funded a Bellagio meeting. Some great things have come out of those meetings. This was a meeting on uh, disinformation in the case of a pandemic. Uh, and we thought that people would be, uh, you know, using the disparity in information and maybe they'd be, when, they, when there was still a pound in, in Ireland, we used the example, maybe they would make up a pandemic uh, outbreak in Ireland and the pound would go, they would short the Irish pound and make money on it. We never thought that state actors and the huge amount of uh, uh, disinformation that the anti-vax community and QAnon and whatever it is that's uh, fomenting this amount of disinformation. And by the way, I, I just saw an article the other day that 80% of all the disinformation about the, the pandemic on Facebook can be attributed to, to 12 people or bots. Um, that, that tells you the leverage that um, malfeasance can have right now. That's amazing. And we're going to have a um, friend of yours, of course, uh, with us uh, later in this week um, to talk about the misinformation side of pandemics. So Heidi Larson will be there. Well, that's great. Yeah.
So um, I'm going to back out, turn this over to the MC, who's much better than I am at questions and answers. Uh, you get the answers, they get the questions. And I want to thank you from my heart. Uh, really good talk. Anytime. So MC, where are you? I'm right here. There uh, he is. Um, so the first question comes from, and nice to see you, Larry, <laughs> as always. Um, I think Contagion did a really good job of um, covering some of the misinformation stuff. And I was just thinking about that part of that movie. Um, David Brenna asks, well, actually, so we, we've promised everybody that we're going to let them pull themselves up onto stage so we can actually have a bit more like a classic Q&A. And I think I'm sometimes forgetting to do that. So, David, are you here? Uh, yeah, uh, if you can hear me. Hello, David. Yeah. Hi, Larry. I'm really honored uh, to have known you then and now. Um, two things. I, I posted two questions. One was a very quick one. You can answer if you like about the U.S. Army's supposed new type of vaccine with 12 immunity stimulation sites. But it is a more general example of my real question, which is <clears throat> from science fictional term terms, of course, uh, our movies and books portray far worse pandemics than we've experienced. If you are a little bit callous, could you look upon this event as having been a really, really good training exercise? Because we got those vaccines a lot sooner than anybody expected. And there are more of them. Uh, first of all, David, I'm honored to share the first three letters of my name with you, or you with me. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the virus that we created in Contagion, which we named MEV1, uh, it was a combination of a paramyxovirus, parainfluenza virus, um, and a hantavirus. And we, we, we created it on a computer. You know, we, we put the genome here and there and made sure that it would be feasible or, you know, that it wasn't too big a stretch of the imagination that it would become uh, transmissible. Uh, that virus probably had a death rate of about 25%. Um, so it was as transmissible perhaps as Delta but it had a lethality of one in four. Certainly, if such a virus were to occur and such an epidemic pandemic were to occur, uh, we would look back with nostalgia on Omicron and it would have been a training exercise. And you're absolutely right about the speed of getting vaccines done. Now, prior to this, the fastest was four years uh, and that was for the measles virus. But, but bear in mind, it was 200 years uh, for the smallpox virus before we had a smallpox program. So it, it's, you know, it, this is really, really fast. And mRNA, um, while I think the mRNA vaccines are poorly suited to a global campaign, because you're not going to get a refrigerated um, vaccine that you have to carry along with needles and syringes and have a health professional who's licensed to give in inoculations, you're not going to get them to one or two billion people who live rural and remote, as WHO has cl classified them. They never get a, a visit from a health worker. Um, we're much better to have an internasal vaccine, a spray, a drop that doesn't require refrigeration. Those are coming on now, and they will have taken three or four years to develop. Um, so we're really grateful for the mRNA vaccines that probably win a Nobel Prize, congratulations. But as a vaccine to stop a pandemic, they're not the right type of a vaccine. They are the right type to keep America safe, the Western um, wealthy countries safe. But um, if, if 85 or so percent of Africans haven't had dose one, um, you, you can tell that it's, it's not adequate. So, so yeah, I'm worried a lot about um, uh, uh, what we would do the next time. And uh, to, to make a vaccine is really difficult. Uh, the mRNA technology may not um, may not work if we're dealing with a, a pandemic that's fecal oral transmitted, like polio is, for example, um, or an arena virus, uh, which we haven't talked about. But an arena virus is a bloodborne disease like Ebola or Marburg. But when it gets into human beings, it gets into your lung and then it becomes a respiratory disease like plague did. You know, we, we had a bubonic plague and then it became pneumonic. So those more complicated and difficult diseases. I don't know how we get a, virus, a vaccine. We've gotten this. So, so congratulations, Nobel Prize, but we still need to get the right vaccine to vaccinate the rest of us. 
So Martin Hahn, I think you had a question about uh, diagnostics platforms, testing, et cetera. Are you here with us? Yes, I am. Thank you for taking my question and a uh, very nice discussion. Um, well, you mentioned the human animal interface with the habitat destruction and all that. Um, we obviously have to work on decreasing the potential for some jumps to happen. But it, to me, more importantly, early on in the pandemic, we've had relatively poor testing capabilities for the public, uh, mostly PCR um, for several months. And it was long wait times for appointments, long wait times for the results, obviously with much potential for spread while people were waiting. So we, we, de we need more rapid diagnostics. What is your view on the development of these? You know, I'm, I'm a little biased. I work for a rapid diagnostics company. Which diagnostic have you but, worked? Sorry? Which one do you work for? Um, All Clear Healthcare. We're presenting tomorrow at the Firestarter. Um, but, you know, that's that's for tomorrow. But what, I think... What platform is it? It's, uh, but we're using Lumira DX for um, an ultra high sensitivity antigen. And we're using rapid PCR, 30 minute PCR uh, on some point of care. And I think I like a, a large platform for that would really be needed to be rolled out for the next pandemic or other public health issues. I like the 30 minute uh, PCR. I'm not a big fan of antigen tests on day one or two of the disease. Certainly, of course. Yeah. I'm a big fan of antigen tests on day seven or eight to separate it from the PCRs that continue being positive. Um, yeah, I think you're you're totally right. I, I've been watching uh, a, a lot of the um, the CRISPR based um, uh, rapid tests and watching as the uh, one has come to market now uh, from MIT. Another one's at UCSF, uh, close to market. Um, I, I like the idea of being able to have a test that you you know your phone can read the luminescence, the bioluminescence, and then report to you that you've got it. Report to the health department. One of the biggest problems of point of care diagnostics is they're never reported into the healthcare uh, department. So you can't track where the disease is. So as good as they might be, and we all, and I've got a room full of, of every antigen test and every molecular test you can imagine, they're all good. But if they're not connected into the health department, then you lose the ability to gather that information, think of big data, and guide you for where you go for your vaccination campaign. Um, so somehow we've got to get all those things integrated. Um, in, in, sorry to interact. Our our platform actually does that. It does report um, to the public health authorities. So there are ways to integrate software and doing that from these rapid analyzers from various companies. Well, let me let me know if it does that. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. and that's a really important objection I've had to the antigen test. But I'm really happy to hear that. Thank you. All right. Um, so it looks like Greg Brando had, I think, a couple different questions all to do with um, long COVID. Greg, are you here with us? If he's not, um, the first two were, were, what is the diagnosis of long COVID? What specific list of symptoms? And then there's a bit of discussion and people were talking about kind of, um, he was saying, how do you separate those cases out? How do you know it's long COVID, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, right on, we don't have a case definition for long COVID. We, we actually still don't have a case definition for COVID itself. Um, that's what CDC usually does first thing. Here's the case definition. Things that look like it are not it. Things that don't look like it may be it. Right now, we're thinking of a time period. There, even the name long implies that it's COVID that lasts long or reemerges long. So if you're talking about after three months or after six months, um, and then what symptoms are we talking about? Uh, they are very often totally unrelated to the respiratory disease that you had earlier. Um, in fact, when, when we were looking at it in a simple way, we were thinking that long COVID was when the antigen antibody reaction takes place all over and you get these uh, capillary uh, hemorrhages, these uh, micro hemorrhages all over your body. But long COVID is much more complicated than that. E even that does not explain some of the other symptoms that you see. So we have a lot of work to do. And, and, and as I said, I sort of look at this as the snake swallowing the elephant. It takes a very long time for the elephant to pass through the whole body of the snake. Um, I think we're going to wind up with a big elephant on our hands uh, as the long COVID cases add up. And, and I think that's less than six months or a year from now that we're going to be seeing this care system to take care of it. Okay. Right. Well, I had, can I ask one more question there? <laughs> yeah, as a follow-on? 
<laughs> yeah, right. We have about um, a minute left. Well, I finally figured out which button to push to get myself on. Uh, so since vaccines and natural immunity are not going to really stop the virus, what can we expect therapeutics to do to help us? Well, they're very different. I mean, vaccines and natural immunity do protect you uh, from getting the disease. Right. Um, there are no therapeutics that protect you. I'm going to put, an, I'm put a asterisk on that in just a second. We want to have out of a vaccine pre-exposure prophylaxis. So before you get exposed, be prevented. We'd love to get something we call PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, so that you could vaccinate someone after they've been exposed, even after they have the first symptoms of the disease. We had that in smallpox. You could vaccinate someone six days after they had uh, begun to have symptoms of the disease. Um, so there are antivirals that have pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis. If you remember Tamiflu, it has pre-exposure prophylaxis, but people would say it's only good for the first day or two when you're starting to get symptoms. So a little bit of post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, I'm uh, really interested in, um, in Paxlovid, the, uh, uh, the Pfizer antiviral. Um, it, 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 it checks all the boxes. Uh, that would make it possible to use it almost like a vaccine. Um, there are a couple boxes it doesn't check, and that is you can't use it if you're taking statins and other drugs. But in 2005, uh, two articles were published simultaneously in Nature and Science. Uh, one was by um, Ira Longini, the other was by um, uh, another, another uh, modeler, uh, Neil Ferguson. And uh, they both showed an experiment where you took Tamiflu and you had a new pandemic virus flu and you saturated the community where it first began. In one case, 300 households, another 100,000 households. And you could use that antiviral as if it were a vaccine. That would be something because it's much easier to take a pill than to take a refrigerated mRNA vaccine up a mountain or across a, a pond in Bangladesh. So I'm looking forward to see whether over the months to come, Paxlovid has that characteristic. Um, right now you gotta take uh, five pills a day for five days. It's not that much better than a vaccine. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Larry. And we'll, uh, we'll conclude there. Um... Really appreciate it. I know, I know you're a busy man, a very busy man, particularly these days. So it means the world okay. to be with us. And um, <laughs> we're getting lots of thumbs up from the audience here. Um, we will uh, we'll now um, head out to our next session.